Boys and their guns. My first experience using a gun took place at the rifle range located in the basement of Dwight Hall. The Air Cadets held monthly target practice using Lee Enfield Armed Forces rifles, which were converted from their normal 303 caliber shell size to 22 caliber. We thoroughly enjoyed the competition. The first rifle I owned was through the generosity of our, of our neighbor, Harry Osborne. He gave me a wonderful 22 caliber Mossberg single shot gun. Our three and a half acre Stevenson Road waterfront property gave me a great place for target practice and a good setting to nab the odd grouse. My father, Brick Harper, was a renowned Powell River outdoorsman, recognized for his hunting and fishing abilities. In those days, fathers went on their excursions with their buddies and left young sons at home. When I reached 15 years of age, my dad decided I was old enough to handle a gun, and he gave me his double barrel shotgun. What a thrill. He took me to the local rod and gun club rifle range to show me how to shoot and handle, and handle my newly acquired gift. I fired the gun a few times to experience the recoil effect. We were about to leave for home when my dad's buddy, Del Langham, arrived. Dad asked Del if he would operate the clay pigeon launcher to see if I could hit the disc. Dad, Del agreed. Dad told me he would say when to shoot. Dell went behind the makeshift woodpile for protection while operating the machine. Adrenaline was at a high when my dad yelled, pull. The clay, di clay disc shot out at the same time as my finger pulled the trigger and the woodpile received several pellets while the disc disappeared into the sky. The shooter became the, clay, the pigeon flying out of the opposite direction. The command was actually for Dell, not for me. Embarrassing for all. A short time later, I was ecstatic to be invited on a waterfall hunting trip with my dad and his group of buddies, including two of their sons and a son-in-law. The location of our trek was to be Theodosia Inlet. The access to the hunting grounds was by boat, leaving from the Government Wharf launching ramp in Oak Over Arm. Mum packed us our snacks and lunches. Dad and I ventured off early Saturday morning, trailering our 16-foot runabout. We were the first to arrive. I paddled a boat from the ramp to the nearby floats, where we awaited the arrival of our companions. The second boat was launched and joined us at the float. Godfrey Wasp was the last boat to arrive. He launched his boat and suddenly panic ensued. Someone had forgot to replace the drain plug at the rear of the boat. When it hit the water, one could just make out the floating bags and goodies in the moonlight night. The plug was found and inserted post haste. The two fellows in his boat got to enjoy a wet lunch, save what we shared with them. We seven hunters left the wharf at 3 a.m. in order to get to our hunting grounds before daybreak. Our spotlights were used to get to the east side of the inlet as we started our one hour venture. The spotlights kept us away from the rocky shoreline, lighting what the moonlight, sorry, moonlight did not show us. When we approached the Theodosia mudflats, we slowed to a crawl, waiting for our boats to run up onto the mud. The tide was receding. Our boats would remain grounded high and dry while we hunted. When the tide reversed, it was time for us to load up and head home. Next, we had to find a hidden area called a blind to get out of sight for the morning arrival of our prey. The four experienced hunters were my father, Godfrey Wasp, Ron Fraser and Johnny Willis. The newbies were me, Bill Dosworth and Stevie Willis. We all clambered into our hip waders, grabbed our gear, lunches and rifles before heading to the nearby brush. 
These mud flats were made up of several open ditches which were filled with salt water when the tide was in and would act as fresh water drainage when the tide was out. The trick was to jump from side to side on each of these unevenly contoured ditches in order to get to our desired locations. Daybreak was quickly arriving, so we were in a hurry to get to our hunting spots, our hunting hiding spots along the shoreline. The experienced hunters were well ahead of us newbies. I was behind Bill when he reached the edge of his first ditch. With his rifle held high in both hands above his head, he made an almighty leap towards the other side of the ditch. He left, but his trusty waders remained well affixed to the sticky mud. When he reached the length of his waders' ties, he and his waders did a face plant in the mud. It was hard to keep a straight face as a spluttering soul emerged with his newly acquired brown tan. I endeavored to help him clean up so we could get to our assigned blinds. The birds started arriving. Bang, bang, bang. The morning quiet was broken as the hunters discharged their weapons. There would be a yell of, I got one, followed by a splash or a thud as the prey hit the earth. I was in the excitement of the shoot when a pesky duck flew right over my head. This is when I learned about recoil and its power. Bang, bang, splash. I was flat on my back looking skyward through mud splattered lenses. I now knew how Bill felt as I attempted to remove myself from the quagmire. Unfortunately, Bill and I spent a major part of our hunting trip standing by a quickly constructed open fire attempting to get some heat into our bodies while drying off to avoid the chill from the cold seasonal temperature. In the meantime, the true hunters were getting their limit of ducks and lesser Canada geese. This was certainly a memorable hunting trip that provided lots of ribbing fodder for our comrades. Over the course of the next 10 years, I was able to participate in many hunting outings with my pals, Vern Butler, Jerry Simmons, Elmer Sadamo, and Tom Dawson. Our hunting experiences were good and bad, but always enjoyable. Many trips saw no game proceeds, but the camaraderie and friendship made it a success overall. My double barrel shotgun, 303 caliber Lee Enfield rifle, and 22 caliber Mossberg served me well. <laughs>